So this is going to be a lot of fun. We have experts in the venture capital finance industry with us today, and we're going to have, this is going to be a, a very lively discussion. Um, heading the panel today is my partner at Haynes and Boone, David Burton. David Burton, not only did he graduate from SMU Law School, but he also has an MBA from SMU. And David has been a partner in our venture capital finance practice at the firm for forever, and he's, frankly, he's probably seen it all, works with a lot of early stage companies as well as later stage companies in the technology space. Um, David is, uh, again, right in the middle, I think, of some kind of uh, uh, merger today, so he's he's sort of multitasking as we go but I think what one of the things he'll he'll tell you is that things are the, the markets getting hotter than it has been in the past uh, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to David please welcome David and his panel the um, yeah there's a lot going on in the venture market and our panel this morning, and I'm going to let each of them sort of introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about them. Their, their bios were on the website, but uh, in case you didn't read all the bios, or, uh, we're going to let them uh, introduce themselves. But before we do that, um, it's always a challenge uh, doing a panel like this, uh, and, and we have a great diverse group here, ranging from founders to uh, uh, venture capitalists to, uh, you know, some with experience on both sides. So uh, I think we'll be able to cover a broad spectrum of things, but it, it's always a challenge at what level and uh, not knowing for sure what the audience uh, experience level will be with, with funding. Uh, so here's what we'll do. We're, we're going to go for 45 minutes or so, but and then try to open this for questions because one way, uh, you know, if if we haven't addressed some things that are of, of interest, we definitely will try to um, let the audience uh, ask their questions. And um, so, and we're going to start with some pretty basic uh, discussions of the funding process, which would include uh, angel type funding and venture capital funding. So. So I would ask maybe that you, if you have questions, you hold them um, to th uh, the last part of the presentation, and then I, I promise we'll, we will allow some time to, to take some questions from the audience. Okay? Um, so at this time, I think we'll, we'll start with, uh, um, with our, our panel introductions, and we'll start with Scott on the end. We'll let each of them just tell you a little bit about themselves. Okay. Uh, can everybody hear me here? Microphone on. Uh, good morning. Thank you, David. Uh, I'm Scott Tyser. Uh, I uh, am one of those adults with uh, attention deficit disorder. That's a uh, code for being a serial entrepreneur and these days being lucky enough from time to time to uh, play angel investor. Uh, I moved back to Dallas, back to Dallas about six years ago after about a 12-year stint in Silicon Valley, was lucky enough to be part of some very successful exits um, and very successful companies. Uh, I've co-founded a couple of startup companies, uh, one with great success, one with what I'd call personal failure, and one that has to be determined at this stage. Uh, in the gaming arena here, I'm working locally with a company called Mobile Mum. That's the British Mum. It's a Apple, Android, and browser-based destination or digital icon for kids' entertainment and edutainment targeted at the two- to seven-year-old space. It's up, running. We've got about uh, 9,000 subscribers to date. It's a freemium model. Uh, we offer content like Dr. Seuss Cat in the Hat knows a lot about that, all the way to uh, one of my favorites, Sid the Science Kid. Uh, we interweave a couple of games in between it, but the play is to be the digital icon for kids two to seven, a safe environment for, uh, for parents. Uh, very frustrated with the Dallas startup scene five years ago. The frustration being money, angels, 
were very hard to find, especially for seed stage startups. You don't have that situation in Silicon Valley. So I started a not-for-profit, non-pay-to-play angel group here locally. And in four years, we put up probably about 40 to 45 companies. And the way we measure ourselves is do they go on to get subsequent funding? And to date, about 70% of them have. So uh, as David will tell you, I kind of straddle both sides of the fence. Just don't, uh, don't tell my wife. Yeah, and, and part of this, you know, to give you a little background, so as, as we have, I think it's sort of important as we address topics and discuss uh, issues here to have an appreciation of where someone's coming from, you know, whether they're the investor side or, or the founder side or in Scott's case, uh, either way. So um, anyway, Mike. Okay, thanks. Uh, it's, it's nice to be here. Um, I guess I should talk about the unbelievable, amazing story of my company, how it got started. I was formerly a journalist. I was between projects, between books, and uh, I was playing an online game with what I thought was a 19-year-old Spanish kid. And we took it over, uh, and we won, and afterwards we were talking about uh, how we could make an even better online social game, and then he said to me, well, I'm a, uh, an entrepreneur and I'd like to start up a video game company with you. And I thought he was completely crazy and I ignored him. And he started sending me emails uh, every week for three months saying, yes, we can. Yes, we can. And I finally j I gave in and I said, okay, uh, l let's do this. And so we started an international uh, online video game company called Sexion. Uh, what we have is a, uh, we're, a, we're headquartered in Madrid, Spain, in Austin, Texas. We have a technology platform. It's cloud-based. You can stick casual online games in it. And we have social components that uh, can be spread across multiple uh, social networks. Uh, we're very scalable. Our first game using this technology is called Connection. We've launched on a, a Spanish social network called Twenty. We've got a few hundred thousand users. We use the freemium model. Uh, people can buy skills uh, that help you in the game. And uh, we're really uh, riding the free-to-pay wave. Uh, We've got an incredible set of investors, some uh, angel investors and smaller investors in Spain. They're mostly part of the IESE uh, entrepreneur network, and that IESE is, is kind of like the Harvard of Europe. Uh, we've got a lot of bankers that are investors. The lead communication guy for Ford Spain in uh, Portugal, the treasurer of Barclays, uh, Portugal and Spain. We have a very interesting investor group. Right now, what we are uh, just started doing is looking for venture capital. It's a dual track, uh, one in Spain. Uh, we're looking at, basically every European country has a version of Silicon Valley. So we're working the Spanish Silicon Valley for, virtual, uh, for venture capital. And we're uh, also working the Texas venture capital firms. And uh, that's where I'm at. Good. Thank you, Mike. Next, uh, John Adler. Uh, my name is John Adler. I'm a general partner with Silver Creek Ventures based here in Dallas. Uh, we are a venture capital firm investing in early stage information technologies. Uh, one of our areas of interest is cloud-based services and managed services. And that's kind of where this fits into it, is kind of entertainment and media uh, based in the cloud. Uh, my background, I'm a two-time graduate from SMU, as David is, um, and um, worked for big companies here in the area and went off and uh, did startups. And uh, it is, uh, it's a disease and an infection, and once you start to do startups, then that's kind of all you can do. So uh, one of the questions I get a lot is, well, how'd you get into venture capital? And the answer is, when you start doing startups, you hang around with a lot of venture capitalists because you're trying to raise money. And uh, in the course of one of those discussions, uh, after a 20-minute meeting that I thought was going great, turned into two hours, um, 
the person I was talking to said, well, how'd you like to come over to the dark side of the table and join the, join the dark side? And, you know, it's one of those kind of Batman moments when the whole room kind of turns a little bit and you think, wow, I never thought of being a venture capitalist. Well, three months later, like many career changes, I uh, became an investor and I've been doing that, that now for about 10 years. Uh, we invest in companies that are everything from two people with a really great idea and a stack of slides uh, to companies that are founders who have raised money and have the company you know, successfully growing and they want to scale. They're looking for kind of institutional management uh, and help to kind of make that happen. Uh, and it's great to be here. Well, John, I'm relieved to hear that when you went over to the dark, dark side, it was to venture capitalists, not a lawyer. I thought you were going to start talking about uh, considering law school. That's so my next that's, that's, that's my next career here. move. So, okay, good. Uh, next will be uh, Chris Mayer. Hello, and uh, thank you for inviting me to be on the panel. It's a, a pleasure coming up here to Dallas from Austin. Um, I'm Chris Mayer. I um, founded Night Owl Games in 2008. I've been in the game industry since about 1998. Um, I've worked as a developer on several online uh, games, uh, mostly massively multiplayer online games. And I've also worked as a publisher um, for NCSoft in North America. So I've, I've run the gamut from being the guy in the trenches who's up late at night making sure the servers stay up for Ultima Online, all the way to managing $50 million development budgets for, uh, for publishing games. Um, but in 2008, I walked away from the big companies, EA and Sony and NCSoft, to start my own thing. Um, and I got together with a friend of mine from college who was an angel investor and also uh, founded a uh, venture capital firm called Crearis Ventures in Houston. And uh, the two of us decided to start a, uh, an online game company in, in the, uh, the browser and social game space. Uh, so since 2008, we've developed um, a game called Dungeon Overlord, which is a massively multiplayer strategy game um, that you can play on Facebook. Um, the, and we've, we've been successful at raising the capital we need through various sources uh, to bring the game to market and to achieve a favorable ratio of cost of acquisition to profitability. Um, so we're in the stage now of continuing to raise capital for expansion um, so that we can grow our user base from where it's currently at about 100 to 110 monthly active, uh, monthly, 110,000 monthly active users um, and try to grow that into the, the million space um, in uh, the United States and internationally um, in Europe and in Asia. I think that covers it. Good. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Matt? Hi. My name is Matt Himmelfarb. I'm the managing partner of Dallas Venture Partners. Uh, we are a venture capital firm that invests in uh, software, business services, web-enabled services, and gaming technology. I, uh, by way of background, I, uh, I am, uh, spent a lot of time on this campus. I'm a JD MBA uh, from SMU. Spent a lot of time in this room in particular. I think the last time I was in here, I was taking one of my last law school exams. So forgive me if I'm a little jittery because there's still a lot of psychic trauma that's associated with that. <laughs> um, I, uh, I also uh, went to the dark side after a brief stint as an entrepreneur. Um, I also remember taking, having to run out of this classroom to take calls because I founded a, uh, a company while I was still in school here. Um, pitched just about everyone in town, including a venture capital firm called Trailblazer, which became my eventual employer after I graduated. I started in Trailblazer in January of 08. Um, worked very, very closely uh, with a uh, company that we founded or helped to found there called Spawn Labs. Uh, and eventually sold that company to GameStop uh, around this time last year. Um, Spawn is not a, uh, was not a specifically a gaming company in the sense that it developed video games, but it was gaming technology. Um, I don't know if any of you are familiar with OnLive, but it was a it's a very, very similar model to that. It's a uh, effectively sling box for video games. So um, after the sale of Spawn, um, I had an offer to start my own firm with, a, uh, with another partner who is based in uh, Des Moines, Iowa. Even though we call ourselves Dallas Venture Partners, we kind of have a footprint across the Midwest. And uh, that's where I've been since. I'm delighted to announce that we closed our first deal uh, yesterday, but I can't tell you what it is <laughs> and for how much or any of the details that'll be out in a couple weeks. Thanks. Just trust you that you did a deal. Yes, sir. Yeah. So anyway, hopefully that gives you a sense of sort of the backgrounds of the panelists that uh, you can see where they're coming from when they uh, discuss things or where you may want to direct a question. Um, I think I'll start with a, a very general question, but it's one that gets asked all the time. And it is, 
in, in particularly of me when I'm working with early stage companies, but it's, you know, how do I get venture capital? You know, how do I get on the radar screen? What's the process like? What do uh, venture capital investors go through uh, their process for identifying and selecting their portfolio companies? So I'd like to start with that. And also, as I've told the panelists here, for uh, we'll make it interactive so uh, people will jump in as they as they feel uh, ready to make a comment. But um, but probably we'll start this maybe with John because he's been on the dark side the longest, I think. And uh, um, we'll, and we'll start with you on that one. Okay. Um, the first place to start, uh, I think, when raising venture capital is to ask yourself, why am I raising venture capital? Is, is it really appropriate? Because there's a lot of ways to fund your company, and venture capital is a very specific kind of funding uh, event with a specific kind of objective in mind. Uh, and, and basically what venture capitalists do is we want to build companies that ultimately create value and we that either get sold or go public. Pretty simple. So if that is kind of what you want to do, if you want to kind of play the long ball and try to create something big, that's kind of what we're in the game for. Um, so, you know, putting a million dollars in and getting two million dollars back is kind of not going to, um, it's not going to meet our, our return requirements or the return requirements of our investors. Um, we're looking for, people always say, you know, 10 times our money or something. That's kind of a general rule, but really, ultimately, we want to get really big hits. So the first question to ask yourself is, should you be raising venture capital? Because with our money comes certain things. Help, uh, institutional help, uh, and um, we are going to take a significant part of your company in terms of equity. Okay, so that's question number one. The second one is uh, a mistake a lot of people make is do a little research. In other words, seek out, you know, venture people aren't hidden places. You can find them. We all have websites. We all uh, talk at public events, and our names are out there. And why is that? Because we're paid to look at new deals. That's part of what we do for our jobs. Uh, do some targeting. So look at firms. Every firm out there says kind of the areas in general that they're interested in looking at. And then go look at the partners inside the firms and look at the deals they've done for at least an indicator of what kind of expertise they have and are they a good fit. So I'll give you an example from just this week. It's, a, it's, a <clears throat> it's fresh in my mind because um, it's probably a phone call I won't return. And the reason is I got a phone call from a, a gentleman in Wisconsin, and he wants to basically uh, interest me in an oil and gas futures deal. Well, there's a few problems with that. Number one, I'm in Texas, and I got a call from Wisconsin about an oil and gas futures deal. That's already yellow flag. Um, number two is we don't do oil and gas investing. It's not our business. If you spent five minutes on our website, you realize we're information technology investors. So do your research, and that'll save you a lot of time. Matt, you want to jump in? Sure, I'll go. I, I agree with just about everything that, that John says, but I want to... Um, I want to talk to it, one, one tiny component of it, and that's the process. I don't think that a lot of people really understand how long and how intense the process is with venture capitalists. Um, John referenced uh, angels versus uh, VCs uh, a, a little earlier, and the angel process is typically a little bit faster. Now, there are super angels out there that have processes that are kind of similar or an analogous to what VCs do. We'll get to you at the end, I promise. But, um, but VCs have a long, pro how many of you have seen the show Shark Tank? Show of hands, okay. So a lot of you, right? That's not how it works. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Cuban is great, but Mark Cuban only has to answer to Mark Cuban. Um, John Adler and myself and, and Scott, we all have to answer to other folks that invest money behind us. And if we don't uh, have a rigorous process, those people get upset. So a process with a VC, when you first engage them, it'll start with phone calls, then you'll have face-to-face -face meetings, and there could be as many as a half dozen of those. It can be somewhat painful, and you'll probably end up revealing a lot more information than you had already, that you had even considered um, pre-NDA. After term sheet, expect the kimono to be completely open, and that process can take anywhere from, you know, the initial process can take anywhere from three to six months, and then once you're past term sheet, it usually takes about a month to two months, depending on how smoothly things go. 
and things sometimes do not go that smoothly. So I would encourage each of you, uh, if you're soliciting VC funds or you want to learn more about it, to talk to the specific VC because they will tell you their process in detail. And I, I do think that that's a really significant point to understand is um, if you're, the process is detailed and it takes time and uh, even companies who have raised venture capital and maybe looking to do a second round among their investors or new investors, that's something that still takes oftentimes months. So. Uh, venture capital is not really an alternative for someone who needs money next month. Um, but I think... Uh, Can I jump in here a bit? Yeah. I'd, I'd like to maybe give you some encouragement and ask the entrepreneurs to jump in here as well. Um, you don't want the money quickly. There, you want to get money from people that can help you and people that you know and people that you're going to work with for months and years. and having that time of four to six months of diligence followed by the the time to get a legal closing done uh, is part of starting to work together and you know a lot of times in our deals and our diligence we'll get into the process and we'll find out that you know there's just a communication problem or somebody's not getting it or whatever and in this way there's an analogy to dating eventually by spending time together and working together on some pretty tough problems you know, you find out if this is going to be really good after everyone's invested and in moving forward. Yeah, I'd like to jump in there. We, since we're just now in the process of this, we've uh, picked out a venture capital software firm in Austin, and we've had a couple of chances to do pitches. And uh, they basically had a group of MBA students uh, research us, and then they interrogated us for a long time and took us apart to little pieces. And it was a really aggressive uh, uh, kind of meeting, but it ended up invigorating the company because we focused on the weaknesses and we started thinking of new ways to do that. And uh, we're still having meetings with this group. So it was really, it's a, it's a tough process, but it's, uh, it's pretty invigorating. And Chris, you want to talk I mean, about I, I agree with most everything that was said, so I'm going to try to just add a couple of things that I didn't hear. Um, one is stressing that it is not a fast process. You need to be you know, pitching and starting the process of raising money well ahead of when you're actually going to need it. Um, this often means starting your pitch process before you think you're going to need it. Um, we've done pitches um, just on, you know, on the predication of well, what if these factors happen in our business, we're going to need money then six months from now. Well, we better get started doing the money raising process now, even if we end up not needing to do it. Just like a venture capitalist can walk away from a deal at the very last minute, and you as an entrepreneur can also walk away from a deal at the very last minute. You do not need, if, if it comes out to where your business turns a, a corner and you don't need the money, then don't take it um, and, and, and go your, your own way. Um, and that's, I guess, part two of what I wanted to talk about as well, is make sure that you actually need the money. Um, when you bring a new investor into your family, which is your company, you're going to be with them for a very, very long time um, until your company is done or in, until there's some sort of exit event. So you want to make sure that this is a person or this is an entity or a group that you want to do business with um, and that you want to help you make decisions because they will be involved in how your company makes decisions. And I'm, I say that ominously, it's also a blessing when you find the right person. If you can find the right group of investors who really have um, some strengths that augment your weaknesses, then it is, an act, it is an excellent, excellent thing for your business to get that very high level advice um, that you yourself may not have. And that can help grow your company as much as money can, if that makes sense. Well, I, I, since we, we have two founders here who have, who have started into the process now, um, and I think I get approached often by founders who are curious about how does life change, what's going to be different for me. Um, I'm curious if y'all have any comments about um, how things may have changed or be different uh, in your role as a founder now that you do have investors involved in the business. Can I start because I had a very positive experience. Um, the, the first investment group that I, get, that I hook, got hooked up with, uh, which was Carreras Ventures, um, they have taken a very active role in my company, and it has been a blessing. 
they have taken over the HR, the administrative requirements, the legal needs of my company, and it's all off of my books. Um, it's just something that has allowed me as a game developer and a game publisher to focus entirely on developing the game business that I have. Um, and then when I have you know, a legal problem that has come in, and it has from companies like Zynga, which are not small companies, I have a support network that I can rely on to help me solve those problems. Um, without my particular investors, my life would be a lot, lot harder, and I'm sure that the development of my company uh, would suffer for it if I had to, to take on those needs. So. Uh, we've also had a very positive experience with our investors. They, most of them are from the Spanish Silicon Valley, so we have on our advisory board, we have an investor who is the head of 11870, which, which is uh, the Spanish version of Yelp, uh, idealista.com which is uh, the biggest real estate uh, investment group in in Spain so we have an advisory board and they're very active they're very helpful uh, they understand the, how hard it is with the startup all the different problems but they've been nothing but supportive uh, we have an, an amazing group of investors well that's encouraging to hear that so far it's been positive um, I would um, you know, from the investor side, uh, like from Scott, John, and Matt, to hear from you, you guys, what you see as typical. What are founder issues? What What are founder issues that you deal with um, that tend to arise in uh, uh, in a new investment? Uh, so I'll take a stab at that. Um, my first advice with folks who are sitting at a table with a napkin trying to form a company is realize it's a partnership and it takes a team to build a company these days. So think about putting yourself on what I would call a vestment schedule up front. And what I mean by that is let's say typically somebody might bring a 50-50 partnership to you or a 70-30 partnership but remember you may get a divorce or you may find that that partnership doesn't have great chemistry or that the contribution that that particular partner was going to bring to the party wasn't quite as great as you anticipated at the beginning of the honeymoon phase. So set yourself up to earn or vest, vest that percentage of ownership over time in case one of you departs. The other plus is when you come to an, a sophisticated angel and more importantly sophisticated VCs, they're going to ask you to go on a vestment schedule. If you're already on a vestment schedule, you have a much stronger negotiation role or position to say, hey, I'm already on a vestment schedule. There's no need to change that. Otherwise, what you'll find is you may start earning your percentage stake all over again. A VC might force you to turn back the clock and say, Okay, ownership is 50-50 between the two of you, but you're going to begin earning that stock at the time that our money comes in the door. So protect yourself. Um, <clears throat> I think this is a really, really important subject for entrepreneurs is to figure out founder issues and try to address most of whatever you can up front. And I agree with everything Scott said. Um, I'll give you just some examples. I know, a, I know of a startup here locally that basically blew up because um, the two founders eventually decided they couldn't work together and they had no way to get back the first founders, the person that wanted to leave, to get back his shares. So you had somebody sitting on the cap table with 25% ownership after a financing that was basically not doing anything. And that causes venture people to want to do other things. So. Um, the, the founder issues are, are, are serious. I, I would, um, 
in, in addition to agreeing with Scott, let me kind of give you some examples of why founders matter. First, you don't have to like each other, but you're going to be partners, so you have to be able to work together and respect each other. You have to, you have to accept your founder's strengths and weaknesses, and I would ask yourself as a founder at each stage of the company, what is the best job for me to help the company succeed no matter what's happening? So uh, in my particular case, uh, we had four founders of the startup company. One of them ran engineering, one of them ran marketing. One decided he just wanted to go write algorithms, which was fine. The other decided he just wanted to be a chip person, and that's how we got started. By the time we finished, the VP of engineering and marketing were doing different things. The chip person was still doing chips, and the algorithm person was still doing algorithms. And I still credit those four guys an awful lot for having the wisdom to say, I'll do whatever it takes to succeed and not be worried about my title or my control or anything else. Um, it, it was very important. One other illustration I'll give you is a local company that right now, um, two founders, doing well, profitable, making money, um, and they did what many founders do, and there's two founders, so how do you divide the equity? 50-50. So the challenge they have right now is one of the founders would like this to be a healthy um, family-owned business that produces earnings as long as it can. The other one would like it to grow into something much bigger and sees a day when their business may be overrun by competitors or changes in technology and wants to kind of take the next step. Uh, and they're loggerheads because the equity split is 50-50 and nobody's capitulated on do we keep our family business and pay ourselves well or do we try to bet the company again and move forward into something else. Uh, and this debate between the founders has been going on for uh, three years. And so the company continues to go along. Yeah, so uh, one thing I wanna focus on here is uh, the plural and founders. Um, very, very difficult to get VC funding if you're just you know, a, a one-man show. Um, founders, plural, exist to complement each other's strengths and weaknesses, um, like a marriage and, you know, the marriage kind of dating analogy that we've uh, been stressing. Um, it is very, very important to find as a VC a team that is functional, but to also realize that those people are in fact people. They have hopes, dreams, aspirations, and their personal lives sometimes and oftentimes do bleed into their professional lives. So if their objective is to, you know, have kind of that you know, family business, if one of them's, if that's their objective and if the other one, you know, wants to go public, it's kind of a red flag on our end. You also want to be able to understand the personality dynamic. Um, I don't know, um, don't know what this audience is composed of specifically, but if you are thinking about um, founding a company, you want to make sure that, again, your personality complements the other one and that there is some sort of hierarchy between the two of you as to decision making. A one particular anecdote company that I was very excited about uh, and was looking at uh, at Dallas Venture Partners and we had a situation where there was two co-founders and they both wanted to be CEO because that's you know it's a lot of glory in being the CEO. Well the glory to me is in being able to run a successful s company. It doesn't really necessarily matter. Both people you know CEO, COO, CTO, you know whatever you want to call it are going to be highly involved in moving the company forward. And so when I asked these, these two um, people to make a decision as to who is going to take on you know, what role, who I would be able to pick up the phone at night you know, and call as the CEO and who you know, would be more in charge of operations, they came back to me and they couldn't do it. In fact, they had hired a consultant to help them make the decision. And, uh, and that was the last phone call that I ever had with them. So hierarchy, decision making, Complementary personalities, I think, is very, very important. And if I could make um, sort of a self-serving statement, um, having good legal help <laughs> is really critical. He's my lawyer. Agree. <laughs> um, because a lot of the things we're talking about now um, would be addressed when you're, you, you should have addressed maybe before you go out and seek your investors as as Matt just mentioned if if you have a if you have something that's dysfunctional or really doesn't work um, you're probably not going to you're not going to make much progress so um, and and going back again to a comment John made 
why would what's your objectives in seeking venture capital uh, and generally it's going to be as as John said you're looking to to grow a significant company that will achieve an exit through an IPO or a, or a sale like the merger I'm going through today is a good example I represented this particular company as a uh, startup did their angel financing did their venture financing and uh, today we're finalizing a, a merger agreement that will result in an exit and, and that's that's a life cycle uh, that that you need to be aiming at my point then being is that uh, you're looking at having a fairly complex uh, capital structure to get to that point and you're looking at having frankly some sophisticated corporate and legal issues that can arise very early um, and so again uh, it is important I think to make sure that you do have some good legal help even early stage uh, because you may be a small company but if these are your objectives and these are what you're shooting for for venture capital then the smallness is only a stage you're going through every large successful company at one time or another was small so um, that's uh, my, my view of, as a lawyer is, is never too early to get a lawyer involved and it's not an issue of how large you are now it's how large you aspire to be and the and the fact that you should uh, it's, it's easier to deal with those issues uh, when you're small than after uh, they turn into problems um, so anyway that's my pitch I have to get my lawyer pitch in um, and one thing I, I would like, since we, as I say, we have two founders here who have been through the venture, uh, the angel process actually, and and our venture capitalists have talked a little bit about the process of venture capital. But Scott's got a lot of uh, experience, which which uh, with angels, which is a different process, and I think it might be helpful since uh, the angel financing is typically the first step into a venture round to understand maybe how that differs uh, uh, on the angel process than, than the venture capital process. So you will probably find as many processes, or I'd like to say approaches, from angels uh, as you will the individuals who are in the marketplace. And what I mean by this is uh, there is a lot of talk about process in raising money. Some angel groups are very, very informal about it. And I can tell you Lone Star Angels is extremely informal about it. Uh, but I'll tell you the ingredients we look at. We look at first and foremost the idea, the size of the market, we then focus on the ability, believe it or not, of the team to communicate that idea. We look at the team and the expertise behind it. And our evaluation criteria may be very, very different than others, but again, we're looking for deals that go on to get funded. I just sat through and experienced a pitch with a local angel group that I could only describe as nothing short of an inquisition with a capital I-N-Q-U. Um, it wasn't pleasant. I looked at the bright side of it. There was a learning experience to some extent. It showed some deficiencies. But the reality is <clears throat> if you're dealing with a seed stage business and you have an angel investor who is pounding on the table literally to know exactly what the business is going to look like five years from now in terms of actual live subscribers and defend that five years out you might want to step back and and ask yourself is this the person to take an early step with this business because I don't know anybody that has a crystal ball that is that good. By the same token, somebody like John will 
look at your financials. Make sure you've gone through the discipline of putting them together. That you've gone through the discipline of the thought process of the costs and expenses of building up the business at least to an 18 month or three year period and that you're not just some crazy person who hasn't gone through to think through of what it takes to build a business. I think it's also showing him, frankly, that, all right, uh, we can work with you because everybody knows nobody is ever going to hit their projections. They're either going to be way, way too low, such as a Google. Google never imagined that it could possibly generate through credit card sales the kind of revenue that it can generate today. By the same token, you might be totally underestimating the expenses and time it takes to get to a certain revenue number. So when you're going through these processes and these interactions with these investors, be realistic. Um, the other thing I would suggest is, especially dealing with angels, um, venture capitalists will typically say, not no, but not yes. So be aware of that. They don't want to say no because if by chance your business really starts to catch on fire, they want to be able to have the opportunity to hop on board that train. Angel investors aren't as sophisticated with that technique. So sometimes they may, might say no early on, and you can go back and revisit it. Let me repeat that. They might say no very early on, and you might get better at your pitch and better at communicating what your idea is, and you may have fine-tuned your go-to-market strategy. So even though they said no, sometimes it's worthwhile touching base with them just to kind of let you know or let them know what the status of things are. By the same token, remember that yes sometimes doesn't mean yes. Yes doesn't mean yes. When you really put and start to try to negotiate the terms and conditions of the deal, they might be personally embarrassed to tell you, you know what, I've changed my mind. Or we had a situation where a gentleman thought he was closing on a very, very expensive house in Carmel, the sale of that house, and he was going to be flush with cash. And he simply didn't want to tell us that, oh, the deal fell through, and I really haven't got the liquidity right now to write that 250K check. Uh, so, so dealing with angels sometimes can be frustrating. Uh, and I think, and, and also, it, I think back in the days, when, when I, after I got my MBA, I, uh, my first job was in corporate finance, and, and I worked at EDS. Back in the olden days, this was in the 70s, and I remember in the, the lobby of the old EDS building, we had the statute that had one of Ross Perot's favorite sayings. As you may or may not know, our, our mascot at EDS was an eagle. And, uh, you know, we had eagle decals on our cars when we went through the, uh, the guard gate. Uh, and, but statute says, uh, eagles don't flock. You have to find them one at a time. And I've always thought that applied a lot to uh, angels. Uh, unlike, you know, the venture capitalists tend to be institutional. They'll have an institutional type approach. They've got a website. You know, as John said, look at my website. Uh, angels don't have websites. And their diligence process can range uh, uh, across the board. In fact, I had one tell me that uh, his diligence process was whether or not he could go home and explain to his wife uh, what the company did and how they were going to make money. And uh, so it's, it, it's totally different than the, than the process you go through with the institutional investors. But, it, but I will tell you, it is a, a cr usually a critical first step in, in the fundraising process. And with that, I would like, and particularly, again, we have two founders that have been through the angel process and are looking at the next step but to have our uh, 
our panelists talk a little bit about, you know, how does uh, a, a, a prospective portfolio company of theirs, uh, how has it affected th their decisions to invest based upon whether they have angel financing or not? Are the aspects of the angel financing that could significantly affect their decision to uh, um, invest uh, venture capital? I can hop on this one. Sorry, my mic was out. Um, so just real quick, I mean, there are definitely a lot, there's a lot of upside to having angel funding. As we referenced earlier, it can come in a lot more quickly, but there's a dark side too. Um, as a VC, some t you know, you can take a look at a deal and you'll be looking at the cap table and it may read like a phone book. And that sometimes is very scary because every single one of those investors has investor rights and they can be very loud and noisy um, and that can sometimes be um, problematic. Um, for getting things done, you may need certain voting thresholds, so on and so forth. Um, and it can be a, a, a difficulty from a corporate governance standpoint. And there may also be certain names that you see that if you've been around the block a few times that may kind of scare you off. So that's, that's one element to it. Um, I want to also talk real quick about something that Scott said that was interesting um, about pass and, and uh, no doesn't necessarily mean no. Um, the VC industry and the early stage and uh, early stage high tech companies is, is very, very relationship driven. Um, when I had my startup company and I was, uh, you know, at SMU, um, I pitched just about every VC firm in town. They all said no. And um, I was very polite and conducted myself in, I think, a pretty good, uh, pretty decent fashion because one of them ended up giving me a job two years later. Um, I think that's important. Um, our f deal that we ended up selling to GameStop while I was at Trailblazer, we said no to. Um, and then seven months later, we had been tracking them and saw their progress. And then we ended up doing that deal. So as you're raising money, you know, be careful who you get into business with because angels, even though they may be writing little checks, that's a, that's a permanent marriage. It's very difficult to get them off your balance sheet or excuse me, off your cap table. Um, but also uh, when you talk with VCs, if they're saying no, um, make sure to preserve the relationship always. Persevere. Yes. Persevere. Uh, I did promise to leave some time for questions, so I'll, I'll stop now with my questions and uh, take some from the audience if we have some, uh, some now. So, uh, yes. Um, my question is actually, I think, involves early, early in the process. Um, hi. Uh, I'm is this working? Okay. Um, can't hear. Uh, I, um, I'm an entrepreneur and I've had multiple businesses that I've successfully started up and built over the years. Uh, but a few years ago I worked um, to put together a social game publisher that uh, after 14 months had um, reached the point with a Dutch uh, VC where, um, and I had, si had them sign all non-use, non-disclosure, comprehensive agreements, and they, um, the, uh, the firm brought in another um, technology uh, guru, and they ended up building the business without me. So my question on a $54 million um, funding deal, uh, so my question there is, um, my, and my solution after that was I started adding legal to my board, which I thought would at least help deter as a, you know, if, the, if there's lawyers that have a stake in a company, that that's at least some deterrent. Um, and plus really quick, good advice. But I think my question for you is, what can entrepreneurs do to defend against um, uh, more hostile action like that? And is there a particular board structure uh, that you would recommend uh, entrepreneurs have to, um, to see the, um, most success in getting through the VC process? First, l b and I'm sure we'll have some comments here, but I want to address your, your comment about adding legal to your board. Um, I don't think that's a good idea for a number. Uh, it's important to have legal, but I would not have them on, their, on your board because if they are a board member, they have different duties than if they're your counsel. Uh, you also do not have the benefit of the attorney-client relationship because the advice they're dispensing as a board member is not as a lawyer, it's as a board member. So my, uh, what I, 
And I get approached often with early stage companies, gee, can you be on our board? Uh, and my position is no, for a number of reasons. Our firm uh, uh, doesn't allow that. But, but also, it, to me, the better relationship is to hire the lawyer to be your company lawyer. He can come to your board meetings and advise the board, uh, and in that uh, and in that position, his advice is protected under the attorney-client relationship. He owes no duties to stockholders. He, he, he's, he is company counsel. So uh, I think you can wind up getting the same legal protection and advice, but you can get it in a, uh, in a better manner if you uh, hire the lawyer to be a company counsel and attend the board meeting. Okay? Um, hey, <clears throat> I'll, I'll add something to that. So. I, I have the, uh, the benefit of having an extremely good lawyer, trial lawyer, on, as one of my investors. Um, now, um, when there is a, a conflict or when I need the benefit of attorney-client privilege, we use outside counsel um, recommended by him. Um, however, having a lawyer as an investor, it comes with its perks, um, notably when uh, you get hostile threats from another company um, to, to come into your business, then the in this particular case, our investor took it as a personal challenge. Um, and whereas this company may be used to pushing little companies like ours around, they were suddenly hit by a truck by a trial attorney who was not willing to be pushed around by a, a larger company. And that has worked to our benefit. So This was Zynga, right? This, this was Zynga, yes. And, um, <laughs> and it, 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 it was amusing. We got good PR out of the whole thing, too. Um, but. Um, you, you do have to be d diligent because there are times when um, a lawyer as an investor will have uh, certain needs as an investor and is not the right person to be giving you legal advice. And it, it, at that point, you need you know, the benefit of an independent outside counsel. But it, it has its perks is what I'm trying to say too. So. I'm, I'm not certain if I'm, if I understand that and we did have outside counsel. I, I, act, I elected to not sue and not make, make, I've got another business that I've just moved my focus to, but the, the, I elected to not go make a big stink and, you know, sue Dutch billionaire and make all sorts of noise. But I guess my question is, I would prefer to not have to deal with that because I'd rather build the business and go through litigation. So my question is, is there anything that can be done besides a non-use, non-disclosure and having appropriate heavy hitter counsel and you know a great board to protecting especially when you go in and the VCs don't want to sign NDAs right away or is there anything that um, is short of due diligence on those VCs that can be done to protect uh, so, so I'm gonna jump in yourself? here I'm not a lawyer okay. <clears throat> there's an old adage in the newspaper industry which I used to be in uh, and I'm gonna extrapolate it to entrepreneurs there, there really are very very few new ideas in fact I'll suggest not a lot of new ideas but there's always a new entrepreneur so ideas really aren't protectable what is protectable is being first in a marketplace and the other adage I learned by being in Silicon Valley for 11 years is first is first second is last and third is absolutely nowhere. So the only way to counter that, and you're not gonna like this, <laughs> is to succeed and to make that business first and make it to where that strategic investor or VC couldn't do anything but back you 10,000% because that would have been the best course of action for them to get a return personally and for their shareholders. I know it's not what you want to hear, but it's just, there's no, you can't patent an idea. Well, John, what, I, you know, what? Yeah, I, I would add, this is a, it's a soft answer, but um, as a recovering entrepreneur, I would tell you, you know, you have to have that bridge of trust with your investor, prospective investor to say, hey, I'm going to show you everything and, you know, you're, I'm going to trust that you're going to treat it responsibly. Um, and, and that's where your research, like figuring out who the partners are and what their reputation is as a firm, have they been around before, talk to other entrepreneurs who have pitched to them about what kind of experience you're going to have. Um, you know, the, the caveat I will give you is, you know, we'll get interested in a specific area 
and we'll look at a lot of deals in that space. And eventually, we're trying to pick the best team, the best fit, the best product, you name it. Um, and, and that's why we don't sign NDAs. I mean, that's one reason, because we, there's that interaction problem. Um, it's unfortunate, and I would agree, I know of a, a very small number of cases where it appears that the venture firm took ideas from one entrepreneur and shifted them to another. And there is really ultimately no defense against that, as we talked about earlier. You can regulate it, you can document it, you can have lawyers, but if people are gonna slide information back and forth, they can do it. Um, and I applaud you for not uh, going back and trying to sue them and everything else, because that's, I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a burn the bridge philosophy. And the models, all the everything, but it was um, it was a matter of you know I could spend the next 18 months of my life fighting with these guys, or I can do this other thing. So I, you know, I think that's you know, the advice. Of your best your best revenge is success is probably the, the last comment I'll give you is uh, kind of a, a um, an Arabic slang, which is revenge is best served cold. So if you have release 2.0 in mind, they don't know what that is. Anybody else? Uh, yes. Um, you know, since this is a video game conference. I just want to circle around a little bit back to investing in video games and how the VCs are doing. In my experience, the VCs are some of the most risky birds on the planet. Um, and video games are apparently a very risky proposition. Um, you know, whether you're looking at traditional game development where you've got long development cycles and large budgets. Uh, versus uh, the newer segments that people are interested in now, like ca casual and social games that might not be as long or as expensive to develop, but there's a, a much shorter body of work to look back on to predict success. I guess my question is, are you guys seeing active investments in actual game development, or are you looking more toward uh, publishing platforms uh, or maybe software as a service? Yeah. Well. I'll jump in for a minute, and I, I highly encourage everyone else to join. Um, video games and the you know the the actual gaming element of it is, I think, a fundamentally different creature than investing in other businesses. The the business that I was involved with, Spawn, was was gaming technology, and so you kind of have to think, you know, it is it is very hits driven, but you have to break it down into kind of more fundamental pieces. So why is it hits driven? It's not just necessarily. Um, the 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 code itself like for instance you know facebook and google they have you know basically i would think you know it's persistent code right they more or less look the same they more or less function the same but you're putting one product out there uh, to consumers but with video games there's all kinds of creative differences that occur game to game and anytime you kind of have that um disintermedi disintermediation between you know what has driven success and in the, the present and in the past versus what you think is going to you know, happen in the future, you're now betting more specifically on people. So I think that it's easier for VCs to bet on the team, the creative team, and understand and share their vision. Um, but it's difficult because it, it's a very, very risky. You're adding a, a completely other element of risk in the design and the catchiness, story, things like that in video games that don't necessarily pop up in you know business software a couple of things to add to that too um, so one the, the market is changing um, the the development costs for the new for new games particularly social games and mobile games have come way down and the risk therefore has also come down so the time to market and the time that and the amount of money needed to, to ship one of these games has gone down a lot and I, I think that's one reason why there's a, more investor activity than you would have seen you know, even five years ago, where you know, to get a game to market, you're talking millions and millions of dollars. Um, the other thing too to, to hit on as well though, is investors that I've talked to, they need to see something of value that they can sell to another company. Um, it's hard to sell a game, especially if you don't own the intellectual property to another company. It's easier to sell a technology platform or a publishing platform to another company. So an investor has to have a, a very clear picture of how their money is going to grow into something that they can sell to somebody else someday in the future um, in order for them to feel comfortable, I think, in investing. Ditto. Uh, I've, got, I've got one last question, and then we're gonna have to break, and then I'm gonna explain what's gonna happen next, but I wanna hear a really good core story. I, mean, I wanna hear from somebody like, this was the biggest mess, it was a disaster, 
and here's the reason why. I only have to name it. Uh, we've got something like Julia. Okay, think about it, and then maybe you can come back to it and see if it was. Uh, I'm, I'm bound by uh, attorney-client privilege. <laughs> well, wait, uh, I'm not sure. Wait, 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 Ron. Sure. What kind of horror story do you want us to share? An investment horror story? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll suggest one horror story. I knew Scott would come it's, up with it's, something. It's the lesson of uh, put the founders on investment schedule, and I'll put some dollars behind it. Uh, four founders, a company called Covad Communications, didn't put each other on investment schedule. Um, three of the founders worked 60, 80, 120 hours a week for a good three years. One founder worked 40 hours a week for maybe five months, exited stage left. Company went public had a peak market cap of about $11.5 billion. Each co-founder owned 7% of the company. The co-founder who departed was a problem child, almost prevented a key set or suite of strategic partnerships that led to the IPO. I had to stand out the gates of his house and plead with him to sign some shareholder rights documents to facilitate some key strategic partnerships. Um, long and short of it, he took about 650 to 700 million dollars home. Two of the other founders took, oh, a half a billion to maybe 600 home. And one of the four founders who will remain nameless maybe took $20 million home. You tell me what's fair. Put, put yourself on a vest schedule. To me, that, that, that's a horror story. It, it's just, you know. <laughs>